something new in radio. New, that is, if you're under 30. Network Radio Drama returned to the air Sunday night when the CBS Radio Network presented the first episode in its new hour-long daily program called the CBS Radio Mystery Theater. The program is being broadcast by over 200 radio stations around the country in an effort to revive a once major art form that lost out to television in the 50s. These are all new programs, but they're being put together in much the same way the great radio dramas used to be, with big-name actors, sound effects, music, and narration. E.G. Marshall is hosting the series, and they'll be using such well-known actors as Richard Widmark, Zero Mostel, Agnes Moorhead, Celeste Holm, and Mercedes McCambridge. Producing and directing the series is Hyman Brown. If you're old enough to remember them, Brown did such Radio Big Era greats as Enter Sanctum and Thin Man. Doug Polding, CBS News. This is KOIN Radio 97 in Portland. It's 10.07. Come in. Welcome. I am E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear. But mostly to the world of terrifying imagination. In the story you are about to hear, the heroine is a young woman of 77 who has reached her golden years with her sense of independence intact, with a spryness to her limbs, very good vision, and excellent hearing. But as you are about to learn, there are times when hearing well is not a blessing. I did it, Mrs. Canby. Are you listening to me? I killed Richardson. No. I did it. Me? No, no, no. I don't want to hear it, Mr. Paulson. Please, please don't tell me about it. Please. <laughs> mystery drama, The Old Ones Are Hard to Kill, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Agnes Moorhead. I'll return shortly with Act One. Now, here's Act One of The Old Ones Are Hard to Kill. It begins with a stethoscope, a blood pressure reading, an electrocardiogram, and an altogether satisfying report on the health of Mrs. Ada Canby. Hmm. Well, can't see a thing to complain about, Ada. That little congestion you had last time is all cleared up. All in all, I'd say you're doing fine. For a woman my age, you mean. (laughs) (laughs) The older the chicken, the tougher it is to kill. (laughs) That's what my grandmother used to tell me. She lived to be 98. (laughs) Speaking of relatives, you uh, see much of Walter. My grandson? Oh, the usual once a year visit. And he always comes up with the same complaint. What's that? That I shouldn't be living all alone. Oh, that big house of yours must get pretty lonely sometimes. Well, the truth is, Dr. George, I'm not alone there. Hmm? You're not? I decided to take in the border last month. Really? I haven't written Walter about it. Uh, I'm sure he'd object to my taking in a stranger, but there's really nothing wrong with Mr. Paulson, except his health, maybe. His uh, health? What's wrong with him? Oh, the poor man's had a terrible cold for the past two weeks. Won't let me do a thing for him, though. Well, now, where did you meet this, Mr. Paulson? Well, he answered the ad I ran. He's just back from South America. Been living in Brazil for years. He's a very nice gentleman, really. He keeps himself and tends his birds. He has the loveliest blue parakeets. You can hear them chirping all over the house. Oh, it's the friendly song. Well, I uh, I don't see anything wrong with what you're doing, Ada. Just make sure you don't go and catch the man's cold. Well, there's not much chance of that. The poor man hardly ever leaves his room. 
Well, how much do I owe you? I'll send you the bill. I'm sure you'll forget all about it. <laughs> Promise me you'll send it. <laughs> You don't mind my turning to you for advice, but I really don't know what to do. It's been three days since my boarder, Mr. Paulson, passed away, and I still haven't told the police what the man said to me. I just can't bring myself to get mixed up in anything like this. Uh, dear, what's the use of writing, Walter? He'll probably think I've dreamed it all up. No, I'll just forget it. Only how do you forget such a thing? Those names, I keep hearing them. Richardson, Lindell. Lindell is innocent. Oh, dear God, what if it's all true? If Mr. Paulson actually murdered this Richardson and Lindell is innocent, only, well, who are they? I wonder if a telephone book, well, well why not? Let's see. Richardson, Richard, oh, I see, H-A-R-F. Yes, here it is. Oh, Lord, there's dozens of them. Well, I'll try Lindell. That wouldn't be as common, I don't suppose. Yes, yes, here it is. There's only about half a dozen, then. D-L-D, oh. Oh, my heavens, Lindell and Richardson. Both names together, Lindell and Richardson Investments. Nine Concourse, four one five three one three two. 
I wonder if... Well, maybe... Maybe it's the only way to be sure. there I can speak to. Yes, yes, please. Thank you. Hello. This is Mr. Tilton. May I be of service? Well, maybe you can. I, I want to know about your Mr. Richardson, uh, about when he died. I think I did business with him once uh, a long time ago. Well, it's ten years, madam, just about. But uh, if you're interested in investment advice... Well, I'll think about it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ten years. Well, it could be a coincidence. I guess it all depends on how he died. Well, Mrs. Canby, please come in. Have a seat. Thank you. Well, now, how can we be of help to you? Well, I didn't come here to get help, Mr. Shelton. I came to help you, as a matter of fact. Or rather, somebody you know. Who would that be? A uh, Mr. John Lindell, the man who was supposed to have murdered Mr. Richardson. I'm afraid I'm not following you. Well, it took me all week to find out what happened to those two men. And finally, I found the story in the old newspaper room down at the library about Mr. Lindell being indicted for killing his partner. But I'm, I'm sure you know the whole story a lot better than I do. Well, of course I know the story, but <laughs> that was quite a long time ago, Mrs. Canby. Ten years doesn't seem so long when you're my age. Anyway, the point is that I can help you, Mr. Lindell, only I can't do it alone. Did you know John Lindell? No, no, I didn't. No, Mr. Richardson, for that matter. The man I knew was named Paulson. Who? Hmm? I rented a room to Mr. Paulson, and he died about eight days ago of pneumonia. I was there when it happened. Well, that's unfortunate, but... Uh... Before he died, Mr. Paulson told me something about Mr. Richardson's murder. He said Mr. Lindell hadn't been responsible, that he, Mr. Paulson, had committed it for money. Oh, Mrs. Canby, listen to me. It was this man Lindell that bothered him. The fact that he was in prison for something he didn't do. I thought I should tell you this, Mr. Chelton, because you knew both of these gentlemen. It said so in the newspaper. Mrs. Canby, my, my dear woman. What? <sighs> I don't know what silly story you heard, but it's completely wrong. There wasn't any question about what happened. This border of yours, whatever his name is... Merely had an obsession. Well, just the same, I thought you could follow through on this business. Yeah. Tell the police. Because if it is true, Mr. Lindell should be freed. On evidence like that? Well, I don't know anything about evidence. I'm just telling you what I heard. <sighs> well, never mind. I suppose I should have told the police myself. Oh, wait. Wait, Mrs. Canby. Uh, let me... Put your mind at rest. John Lindell is no longer in prison. Do you, sir? He's dead, Mrs. Canby. He's been dead for the last three years. Oh. He wasn't a young man when all this happened, when he accused his partner, Fred Richardson, of defrauding him and shot him dead. He died? In prison? Even if all you say is true, that this man was Richardson's murderer... You can't help John Lindell any longer. He's beyond that. But his name, don't you want to clear his name? Have you any proof? Any living witness? Just myself. But you'd be willing to involve yourself? Start a whole new investigation? Open up the whole dreadful mess again? Mrs. Canby, do you know that John Lindell had a daughter? No. 
But wouldn't that be all the more reason to do something? His daughter's married, living in Minneapolis, a husband and three children. People have forgotten about her father by now. Would you want that poor woman to see his name dragged through the newspapers a second time? But if her father was innocent... Forget it, Mrs. Canby. That's my advice to you. The old wound is healed. Don't reopen it. Oh, and it troubles me so. I haven't thought of anything else since it happened. Perhaps if I saw... A minister, if I had some advice from a man of God, maybe... Mrs. Canby, now you've said something. Now you've shown me the way. That's where our answer lies, dear woman, in prayer. Mm -hmm. In the forgiveness of our dear Lord. Will you pray with me, Mrs. Canby? Pray? Here? Why not? God is everywhere. Please, join me. <sighs> dear Lord... Tell us what to do. Give us your divine guidance. Show us the path to righteousness. Mr. Stratton, I... Help us, O oh Lord. Help us to understand. Teach us to forgive the sins of others and to forget them. To forget. I feel much better now, Mrs. Canby. Do you? I'm not sure. Let us turn this matter over to God, Mrs. Canby. Not to the police, but to the Lord. It's in his hands now. Don't you agree? Well, in a way, that's true. Since they're dead now. All of them. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Canby? Yes. Uh, my name's Stuart Winfield, Mrs. Canby. Mm -hmm. I understand you have a room for rent? Yes, 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 I do. Well, I'm new in town. I just arrived from Philadelphia. I've been staying at a hotel, but I'd like something homier. Well, the room I have is $35 a week. I can't offer you any meals, but you can use the kitchen all you want. Well, that sounds good to me. Would, uh, would you like to see the room? Yes, ma'am, I sure would. Well, huh? Come on in, ma'am. Thank you. By the way, how did you know I had a room for rent? Hmm? I was going to place an ad this weekend. Oh, I, uh, I, I guess someone at the hotel mentioned it. I, I forget just who. Say, this is a real fine old house, Mrs. Canby. Mm -hmm. I can see that I'm going to like this place. Just fine. <laughs> And so, Mrs. Canby has a new boarder. He's a very personable young man, with a great deal more charm than old Mr. Paulson had. Perhaps in a little while, Mrs. Canby will be able to forget her former boarder and the shocking confession he made on his deathbed. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. took no time at all to make himself at home in Ada Canby's big old house. He loved everything about his room. The fine old four-poster bed, the crazy quilt that Ada herself had sewn up 40 years ago, the lace curtains on the window. He even loved Mr. Paulson's blue parakeets. But what he really seemed to like best was Mrs. Canby herself. Just take me two minutes to get these clean sheets on the bed, Mr. Here, Peter. let me give you a hand. No, 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 I can manage. I've been making this bed for almost 50 years. 50? You've lived in this house that long? Moved in here when I got married back in 1919. My husband David bought it for us. Our only son, Ralph, was born in it. And you've lost them both? Yes, they're both dead, but I haven't lost them. Oh, yes, yes, I understand, Mrs. Canby. I guess I feel that way about my mom. Your mother's dead? Yes, she died when I was two. Well, listen, Mr. Winfield, are you sure you want these birds in your room? Mm -hmm. I could take them to the parlor if you want. No, no, I think they're great. I, I think everything's great about this house. But there is something you can do for me. What's that? 
Would you mind not calling me Mr. Winfield? Oh? Uh, that's what they call my father. My name's Stuart. Well, well, all right. Stuart. Dear Walter, I think it's about time I told you that I have a boarder in my house. Mr. Winfield is the nicest young man you could want to meet. He's a great deal friendlier than my first gentleman, Mr. Paulson. And he seems to like nothing better than to sit around evenings and talk. We talk about his home and his parents and his plans for the future. I think the poor boy misses his home and family, and I'm sort of a substitute for all that. Hmm. You know, it isn't really fair, Mrs. Canby. You said I had kitchen privileges, but that doesn't mean you have to cook for me. It's a pleasure, Stuart. I haven't had anyone to cook for in years. You're kidding. You mean to say you cook this good without practice? Oh, you're just being nice. I'm sure that stew is just plain ordinary. It's terrific, no kidding. It, it tastes like, well, it it tastes like home, if you know what I mean. But it depends on whose home you mean. <laughs> Well, my mom cooks stews like this. That's what I meant. Your mom? Hmm. Well, but she died when you were only two. Oh, well, I, I guess I, I didn't mean my mom exactly. I, I was thinking of my Aunt Martha. Uh, I mean, she's the one who sort of took over the cooking and stuff after my mother died. And my father's sister, you know? I see. Well, that was lucky that you had someone to take her place. Yeah, that's right. It's... Oh, Excuse me. My, Stuart, yeah. you're not coming down with anything, are you? <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. Just a little case of the sniffles. Listen, if your room isn't warm enough, I have an extra book. No, there. no, the room's just fine. Don't worry about it. Well, you'll be sure now. I know I felt a little guilty about poor Mr. Paulson when he got sick. Uh, maybe I didn't take good enough care of him. The uh, Paulson? Mm-hmm. Was that your former boarder, the uh, the bird lover? Yes, yes, that was his name, the poor man. Well, tell me about him. Well, I don't really know that much about him. He lived here less than two months. Well, what sort of a guy was he? Well, very quiet. He kept to himself. Did you say he was from South America? I don't remember if I did or not. Well, you must have said it. Yeah, yes, of course. He was American, but he'd been living in Brazil. I don't know why exactly. Although, come to think of it, maybe I do. What do you mean? Well, it, it just occurred to me that Brazil might be just the place for someone who came into a lot of money and, and wanted to leave the country. I don't understand. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, I really think you I... are giving a cold, Stuart. I'm getting that blanket out this minute. No, wait, Mrs. Candy. I'd rather hear Never about... Never mind. I don't want to take any chances. I'll be right back. Yes, Mrs. Candy. Don't take any chances. Stuart? Yes? Come in. I bought your tray, Stuart. Oh, no, you shouldn't have. <laughs> you shouldn't have gone to all that trouble, Mrs. Kennedy. It wasn't least bit of trouble. Besides, you've got to have some supper. Feed a cold and starve a fever. That's what I mean, I, I was going to come out to the kitchen and, and get myself a sandwich or something. You didn't have to bring it to me. Oh, look at that. Is that roast chicken? Well, that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Mm. I hope it tastes all right. A noodle soup with dumplings. Mrs. Candy, you're spoiling me rotten. Do you know that? <laughs> yeah, I just thought it'd be a good idea if you stayed in bed and took it easy. You weren't planning to go out tonight, were you? No, no, I was just going to stay in and read for a while. <coughs> Maybe watch television. Oh, yeah, that's good. Here, I'll just set this tray down. <laughs> oh, the service here is just too good. Oh, we, <coughs> we never... Uh, we never finished our talk the other day about that border of yours, uh, Mr. Paulson. Well, there's not much to say about him, really. Well, you said something about his living in South America. <laughs> you said you thought you understood why he was living there. Sounded real interesting. Well, the truth is, Stuart, there is something to tell about Mr. Paulson. <laughs> maybe, maybe you can help me feel better about it all. About what? Now, I'm not going to tell you if you don't eat. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Canby, I'll, 
I'll eat. Well, it happened just about three weeks ago. Something with this candy, that's about the best roast chicken I've had in years. I'm sure I spoiled your appetite with all my chatter. <laughs> no, no, that was a really interesting story. But what do you think of it all, Stuart? Hmm? Do you think I did the right thing? Well, frankly, Mrs. Candy, I do. Honestly? Well, this guy Chelton sounds a little screwy, but <clears throat> I think he's all right. I mean, from a practical standpoint. Then you agree with him? Sure. This man Richardson's dead, right? And... What's his name, Lindell? Yes. Well, he's dead too, right? And poor Mr. Paulson, the man who supposedly killed Richardson. Well, there you are. <coughs> Nothing you can do will bring any of them back, right? Well, yes, but just the same. And you know the police, Mrs. Canby. They'll be hounding you forever. <coughs> tracking mud into your parlor, bothering you with questions. No, Mrs. Canby... You're too nice a person to put up with that kind of thing. You mean too old a person? I just think Mr. Chelton was right. Let sleeping dogs lie. Yes, that's what I keep telling myself, but you know something? What? <coughs> There's one thing Mr. Chelton forgot. And me too, I suppose. What's that? Why, the real murderer. He may still be alive, even if all the others are gone. Don't you see? No, I... Uh... I don't. Even if Mr. Lindell can't be helped anymore, that doesn't mean the real murderer should get away. But the real murderer is dead. Paulson. No, the killer is the man who hired Mr. Paulson. Don't you see? Is it right that he should get away with it? No, wait a minute. <coughs> You're jumping to conclusions. No, I'm not. Mr. Paulson told me that he was hired to do this thing. Well, maybe he was hired by Lindell. Maybe Lindell hired him, and then Paulson got cold feet, and Lindell did the shooting himself. No, I'm sure that isn't true. You see, I read the newspaper article all about it. Well, you you really were thorough about this, weren't you, Mrs. Candy? <laughs> you poor man. That cold's gone to your chest now, hasn't it? No, I'm all, I'm all right. Stop, stop worrying about me. Let's talk about this. This other problem of yours. Well, maybe I'm making it more of a problem than it should be. Maybe if I just told the police everything, I could forget it once and for all. No, I, uh... I, I really couldn't advise that, Mrs. Candy. Well, it said in the newspaper story that the two men were partners in that investment firm. And Mr. Lindell thought that his partner, Richardson, was cheating, taking money out of the firm... And that's why he's supposed to have shot him. Wasn't there a witness to the shooting? Why, yes, I think there was. Come to think of it, it was Mr. Shelton. That's right, that's right. Well, <coughs> doesn't, that, doesn't that wrap it up for you? Well, it would if it wasn't for Mr. Paulson. Listen, Mrs. Candy, you know how much I like you. Well, in just a few days, you're more like family to me than my Aunt Martha ever was. Well. Nice of you to say, Stuart. And that's why I want you to listen to me about this. That's why I want you to forget about this whole foolish thing. And... Listen to you. You sound awful, Stuart. Just terrible. No, I'm all right. No, you're not all right. I'm going to get you some cough medicine right this minute. <coughs> Stick around for a few more days, Mr. Chelton. The old lady's beginning to get fidgety, if, if you know what I mean. <coughs> well, something tells me that Stuart Winfield isn't such a nice young man after all. 
Could it be that he wasn't telling Mrs. Canby the truth about his dear mother and his Aunt Martha? Could he have not told her the truth about his plans for the future? Of course, the real issue is, what sort of plan does he have for Ada Canby's future? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. I'm High Brown, and as producer of Radio Mystery Theater, welcome to the premiere of an exciting venture in modern radio, the return of spine-tingling suspense and mystery seven times a week with fine actors and actresses and one other star player. Your imagination. We'd like to hear whether you're glad radio drama is back. So we're holding a weekly drawing for three weeks with 50 prizes a week, two AM-FM stereo phonos, two travel clock radios, and 46 anthologies of modern suspense. All you do is send us your name and address to Mystery Theater, Box 50, Radio City Station, New York 119. Box 50, Radio City Station, New York 119. All for good everywhere, unless locally prohibited. Our drama continues in one minute. Mrs. Canby. She isn't sleeping well tonight. But of course, Mrs. Canby has good reasons for insomnia. Her thoughts are whirling. But Border Stewart was right. She doesn't want the bother of going to the police. And she firmly believes in the old adage, if you don't trouble trouble, trouble won't trouble you. But still... Oh, my. I'm just never going to get to sleep tonight. Poor Stuart. He's still coughing. I'm sure that room is just too drafty. I never should have let any boarders in until I got the windows fixed. Oh, dear. That poor boy. I'll never forget the terrible night Mr. Paulson was coughing so badly. And the way he looked, all gray and shrunken. If only I knew he was so sick. No, if only he'd never even come to this house. Mrs. Canby, I killed Richardson. I did it. Will I ever forget the sound of that man's voice? Mendel is innocent. Mendel is innocent. That poor man. All the years he spent in jail for something he didn't do. Let sleeping dogs lie, Mrs. Camby. My Aunt Martha always said, let sleeping dogs lie. If only I could get some sleep. Let us turn this matter over to God, Mrs. Camby. Not to the police. Not to the police. Not to the police. What a strange man he is, that Mr. Chum. Where he talked about God, praying at his desk. Of course, God is everywhere, but his desk. I killed Richardson. I murdered him for money. I was paid. I was paid. Paid? Paid. Someone had to pay him. Mr. Paulson wasn't the only guilty one. Someone else was, too. Forgets. 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 Oh, dear Lord. Mr. Shelton. Shelton. What did that newspaper article say? The chief witness against Mr. Vendell was Arnold Shelton. But how could he be a witness? Just something that never happened. How could he be? I'll have to tell someone. I'll have to talk to someone. Yes, I'll tell Stuart about it. In the morning. Stuart, are you awake? Yes, I'm up, Mrs. Candy. Come in. Oh, oh no. 
Now, don't tell me I'm getting breakfast in bed, too. Well, I know you had a terrible night last night, Stuart. You were coughing much worse than ever. I guess that medicine wasn't very good. I'm sorry I kept you awake, Mrs. Candy. Well, that wasn't your fault. No. Something else kept me up. What was that? Oh, my mind, I guess. Maybe I should say my conscience. Well, that sounds serious. <laughs> well, it is something serious, Stuart. Well, I might have let a man get away with murder. No, it's even worse than that. He did something worse than murder. You're talking about Paulson again? <laughs> no, I'm talking about the man who hired Mr. Paulson. He didn't just have that man Richardson shot. He let an innocent person go to jail and die there. Now, that's like committing two murders, if you ask me. I have to tell you something that occurred to me last night. Sure, go ahead. Well, it's about... Mr. Chelton. Mr. Arnold Chelton. Yeah? Go on. Uh, I'm listening. Stuart, I wonder if maybe the reason Mr. Chelton was so upset with me, the reason he didn't want me to go to the police, was because he was afraid. Explain what you mean. Well, what I mean is maybe Mr. Chelton had good reason, besides the one he told me. He was working for both Mr. Richardson and Mr. Lundell at the time of the murder. Oh, well, so what? Well, he was also the chief witness at the trial. A witness for the prosecution. But he saw the shooting, didn't he? Well, that's just the point. He saw Mr. Lundell shoot Mr. Richardson. Well, that's not what you told me last time. I mean, that he was an eyewitness. No, that's right. He didn't actually see the shooting. He was miles away when it happened. I don't quite remember the details. Is there was something about a phone call, maybe? Y yes. Yes, that's what it was. He claimed that Mr. Richardson was talking to him on the phone when Mr. Lindell showed up at his apartment. He said that Richardson cried out something about Lindell having a gun. And then he heard the shot. But how could that have happened if the gun was fired by Mr. Paulson? If, Mrs. Canby, that's the big little word, isn't it? If. <laughs> but don't you see what I'm saying, Stuart? Arnold Chelton had the most to gain. Gain? From what? From both these men leaving the firm. That leave the whole thing to him. All those customers, all the investments he handled, all the commissions, or whatever they call it. Are you accusing this guy Shelton of being the killer? Yes. It's it's the only answer, Stuart. Well, look, if that was the case, the, <coughs> the police would have figured it out. But they didn't. There was nothing in the stories I read that pointed any suspicion at Mr. Shelton. I don't suppose it even occurred to them. And now... The company is all his. Well, you don't, you don't call that evidence, do you? <laughs> well, then why did he let me go to the police? Why did he try so hard to talk me out of it? That man was praying to it. He was taking the name of the Lord in vain. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Stuart. I'm so sorry. I won't bother you anymore. I know what I have to do anyway. <coughs> Mrs. Candy. I won't wait. be gone long, Stuart. No, no, wait. But the minute I get back, I'm going to call Dr. George and ask him to come over. You're sick. Never mind the doctor. Are you calling the police? No, no, I won't call them. You're right. I don't want them tracking mud in my parlor. I'm going down to the station house and talk to them. I'll get dressed now and go straight there. Please, please think about what you're doing. I'll tell them what I know and they can do the rest. Now, you try to eat something, Stuart. Please. Mrs. Candy. Oh. <coughs> Sheldon? What is this, Winfield? I told you not to call me in the office. It's an emergency. You sound terrible. What's the matter with you? I'm sick. Only you're going to be a lot sicker. 
What are you talking about? The old lady. I can't stop her. She's decided to talk. What? She figured it out. Figured out exactly what you did, Sheldon, and how you did it. You fool. Huh? You've got to stop her. Do you hear me? That wasn't part of the deal, Sheldon. It's all of the deal now. The price didn't include anything like that. The price just uh, doubled. Uh, old ladies uh, are always having accidents. Make her have one. Make her have one now, Winfield. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> she's going to... She's going to have a fall down the cellar steps. Right now. <laughs> I, I got to get my robe on. And my slippers. I, I've got to hurry. Stuart? Is that you? Open up, Mrs. Clancy. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart Winfield, what are you doing out of bed? Now, you go right back there this second. I got I to gotta talk to you, Mrs. Canby, before you go to the police. Just listen to you. You're all winded. You can hardly talk, Stuart. Now, go back to bed before you catch pneumonia, too. Now, don't go, Mrs. Canby. It would be better if you never went to the police. Better for you. Better for me. For you? I don't understand. Well, then I... I wouldn't have to hurt you, Mrs. Candy. <laughs> That's what I mean. I wouldn't have to do anything bad to you. Stuart, what in the world are you talking about? Come on, old lady. Stuart. You're smart, all right. You really think things through. So now think a little harder. You knew? Stuart, you knew about Mr. Paul? <laughs> That's right. That's how you knew my room was correct because Mr. Uh. Chapman. Now you're getting there, Mrs. Canby. And that's why you rented it. That's why you were sent here. Just to watch you, Mrs. Canby. Just to see oh, that you stayed yes. sensible. Mr. Chapman, Mr. Chapman did. I was hoping you'd never change your mind about calling the police. No, that... I didn't want this part of it. This isn't the part I like. Oh, let me go. Okay. Just relax, oh, Mrs. Canby. Just take it easy. Please, please, well, don't. Well, you're as light as a feather, Mrs. Candy. Just like my Aunt Martha would have been if I, if I had an Aunt Martha. Stop, please, let me go, please. We've got a date now, Mrs. Candy. Let me go. Stop, Eddie. Don't put up such a fight, Mrs. Candy. I'm sick, remember? Stop, Just shut your eyes. Please, shut your eyes and... Don't look down. Oh, my God. Uh, Stuart, those stairs. It's just your eyes, old lady. Oh, my God. Hey, I'll be home with you. Stuart! Stuart! It's, uh, it's all right now, Ada. Uh, Just be glad that it wasn't you at the... Bottom of those stairs. Well, will he be all right, Dr. George? Now, what do you want to worry about that man for? Truth is, his uh, injuries don't amount to very much. A couple of broken ribs seem to be the worst of it. But he'll be a patient for some time before they can put him in prison where he belongs. Him and his uh, friend. What was that man's name again? You mean Mr. Chelham? Have they arrested him? Yeah, yeah. That's what the police detective said. I don't understand. Stuart's injuries aren't serious. It's not the fault that made Winfield so sick. His case was diagnosed as simple pneumonia at first. And then I remembered about your first border. Nelson, was it? No, false. Yes, false. But he had pneumonia, too. He died of it. Oh, is, is pneumonia contagious? Yes, yes, it is, but... This disease was even more contagious. It's a pneumonia caused by a disease called psittacosis, better known as parrot fever. Uh -huh. You get it from sick birds, like the parakeets in your spare room. Oh, no. Mr. Paulson's bird. Sorry, Ada, but they had to be taken out and destroyed. Oh, what a shame. There's one reason, uh... I feel sorry for them. They saved your life. 
Made Mr. Winfield too weak even to throw a little old lady down a flight of steps. Uh, those poor little creatures. Yeah, but you can be grateful they didn't make you sick, too. Mm. Parrot fever is so contagious that no more than one person in a thousand could be exposed to it and escape infection. It was pretty darn close to a miracle, Ada. We're hard to kill, Doctor. Remember? The old ones are hard to kill. They say that people are living longer than ever before. And when we look at Ada Canby, we can understand why. She's a tough old lady. So tough she could withstand the threats of man, beasts, and bird. So let that be a warning to all those who think that our senior citizens are easy prey for crime. Watch out. They may turn the tables on you. Or the stairs. I'll be back shortly. have one final comment for you on behalf of Ada Canby and old people everywhere. There's a saying, there's no fool like an old fool, but it's also true that there's no wisdom and strength like old wisdom and strength. There. Does that make you feel better about your next birthday? Our cast included Agnes Moorhead, Leon Janney, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. You spoil me shamefully. And that night, I spoiled her just a bit more by bringing hot cocoa to her in bed. Oh, no, drink it down now. Does it taste all right? Oh, it tastes just fine. Now, that was very good news. Because I prepared the hot cocoa myself. And I had no idea whether 25 melted sleeping pills would seriously affect the flavor. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. <laughs>